Hello, everyone. I'm going to start off by introducing this forum. I'll soon be going back to Germany. Um, I've been here collaborating with uh, Gallaudet in collaboration. And I'll let Carolyn Solomon introduce herself. Hello there, my name is Dr. Carolyn Solomon. And I am co-chairing this um, Lexicon Biology Workshop. I've been working in the field for over 20 years, or excuse me, oceanography. And I've been in the field for over 20 years. I've working with uh, deaf and hard of hearing people in STEM. I'm very excited to have you all here today. I know it's the end of semester. It's so nice um, to have the students and staff be interacting with all of us. This has been an incredibly rich experience over the past um, few meetings. I'm very disappointed that um, uh, Ingo has to leave to go back home. So this is our final round table and we will be wrapping up our discussion. Maybe wrapping up isn't the right word. Uh, we will continue this work, but it is more so the end of this round table series. Um, and we'll have to discuss what's next because it's important that this work is continued. So we will have, we have a small number of people here on Zoom today, meaning that this meeting can be much more interactive than previous roundtable discussions. So I think everyone is able to pull on their screen. I don't think we need to spotlight anyone specifically. I think today, because we have such a limited number, that's fine. So yeah, feel free everyone to turn your videos on. because there's not too many people, I don't think. We can have a more open discussion and a free exchange of ideas in our roundtable discussion. So again, everyone I think will fit on the Zoom screen. If you would like to raise your hand for the purposes of turn taking, we could do that with the spotlight, but otherwise we don't need to. Yeah, I think it would be nice if everyone turned on their camera so we could see who's in attendance. Please don't be shy. Hello. Uh, yeah, time has really flown. I can't believe we're going back to Germany. Yeah, I know the time went by just like that. Mm. Well, I'm happy to see that the both of you are have been working together and um, happy to see that. And I hope that this continues. Yeah. Hi there, Jason. I think Naomi's here as well. Good to see you. And Kayla is here. Yep, she's here. She's eating right now, and so she doesn't want to have her video on while she eats. Katie's here too. And then Daniel Lundberg. And then Cristiano. So what should we start with, Dr. Solomon? I think let's start with the game. <laughs> because really, a lot of our discussion thus far has been specifically about lexical items, words to signs. So I think today, let's talk more about things from a conceptual standpoint. So, um, you know, whoever volunteers, or maybe they can private message, they can send something out that's a concept, like a conceptual process, whether that's a picture or a video. And then let's sign it, however you would sign it using your own language and how you would describe that concept. And then let's try to guess what that concept is. Ooh. And so we won't need English interpretation for that piece. And so will we be given some context for this? I mean, like, 
will someone tell us, okay, this is something in biography, biology or chemistry? Right. Yeah, we'll give you a few examples. Okay. I'm actually a data scientist, so I'm not a hard science person per se. And I'm in the field of chemistry. So hopefully uh, things will be understandable and clear. And Jason, what did you want to say? Oh, I'm in math, so. And then we have uh, Car Carolyn Solomon for biology. So we have, yeah, half chemistry, half biology here. Did you want to volunteer first, Audrey? Okay. This is Audrey, should we go ahead and read this first? Yeah, just briefly. So is it mine or yours? Yeah, just taking a look at the list here. All right, are we ready? Yeah, I'm gonna try. So don't do ASL? You can use BSL, that's fine. Is it global warming or climate change? This is Jason, but what is the sign? Okay, that's how you signed it. Is that good? Yeah, great job. All right, and now Jason, why don't you pick one? I only have a very basic knowledge, so hopefully uh, someone will give me something. <laughs> okay, we'll try to give you something more math-based, something physics-based. Okay. Um... Did you have things prepared? For physics, no. I mean, for biology, I've got some items ready, but not for physics or math. That might be something better for you. Yeah, give me whatever you have. Hello, Athena. I have some uh, signs that are related to physics and biology, if you'd like me to share those. I 
I have uh, some signs that are related to EG, electromagnetic signals that are usually um, related to related to a cap that's used on the head that has like magnetic waves. Um, so what I'm thinking, is with fatty acids, do you have a sign for fat? Okay, you spell fat. What about a sign? Does anyone have any various signs for fat? No, I've seen this one on the face. But what about the concept of fat inside? Because I've seen this one, you know, because when you cook with fat, you might see it like that mm -hmm. in the pan. But any other signs for fat or anything better for fat? I'm boring. <laughs> this is Caroline. I just spell it. What about acid? You know, but I realize that that sign that you're using here could work because it does show somewhat of a structure, right? Like it shows that sort of linear structure that a fatty acid might take. Yeah, biology is important. Right. But you can you know, see triglycerides, the three. Do you have a sign for triglycerides? Uh, not really. I sort of make one up. All right, you're making one up with the three fingers, but no one has a go-to sign for triglycerides. I thought it would be something I could put out for discussion. And... Uh, Mm, okay, that's the sign. All right. I don't want to spell everything. Sorry, I missed that one. Do you have a sign for protein? I do, yeah. yeah. We do have a sign for protein. So for example, with protein, it depends on the context. So if you're talking about protein as a part of nutrition, then you sign protein like this. But if you're signing protein like an enzyme, then I sign protein like this because it's talking about the energy related to protein. And I've also seen people who are more interested in proteins with chemistry and the structure to sign protein like this with a twist or protein like this because proteins themselves have the alpha beta structure. So protein sort of mimics that shape. So again, it depends on what level, are you looking at the level of a protein being folded or a protein as energy or a protein as a nutrient that you eat? Is the same in Germany? What about BSL? Oh, this is Audrey. This is how we would sign it. So that's, this is how we would represent protein, but um, that's more local. There might be some, some discrepancies uh, depending on the context. 
Okay, so not like as a nutrient, but what about in Germany? So yeah, we have three or four different signs in DGS. We have this. The second sign is this. Protein, huh? This is another one. Okay, which is kind of similar to what Dr. Solomon had did. And then this one here. Right, and you know, and that is important. Uh, it's interesting because we have so many of those signs, but then we don't have a sign for fatty acid, which is also important. I'm looking up at ASL core to see if they have anything. Oh, protein, yep, uh-huh. Yeah, that's how they represent it on ASL core. And Naomi? Well, and I think that, yeah, we could have this discussion about, you know, maybe which aspects of these signs we like to come up with something that works. So Naomi, I know that data science is kind of a new field. Are there any concepts that you wish there was a sign for? Well, there's really no sign for any of it, to be honest, but we do look at some BSL signs as a reference and some of those signs um, could work. For example, something like this, that's data science. Yeah, data, uh huh? And BSL, that's what they typically use, which I thought was interesting. BSL also has quite a bit of uh, similar signs, for example, uh, and they, those de depend on the context, largely the mouthing of the sign, right? Yeah, that is right. And I found that very interesting because there was one thing I was looking at and I thought, hmm, this is a good question. I should think about it. And I would love for this group to help me figure it out. So I'm glad you brought it up. This is Audrey, you know, in our first exchange, thinking about data and having conversations, but, you know, thinking mm -hmm. of it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've know, seen thinking that about side. computers. So data like this. And I'm not saying that this is something you have to use. I'm just offering it up. Um, of course. As, you know, signing for kids, we signed this mm -hmm. for school uh, as an offering because the school doesn't necessarily have the signs for those. So those are signs we've offered to help in schools. Yeah, one thing that I really appreciate is that I have noticed that BSL has quite a bit um, more um, biology, computer science, science, but data science itself is such a new field. Yeah. So it's really hard. Uh, you know, a lot of those, those concepts are fairly new and evolving quickly. So it almost feels like we're a little bit behind and we need to catch up in terms of how we can represent them linguistically. But, you know, for the example, program, the traditional sign of program like this doesn't necessarily fit in the world of data science yeah, in, or programming languages, excuse me, things like Python, you see signs like this, but again, that's not really conceptually accurate. So yeah, right, there's signing it like a snake, thing. right? I think too, you know, you know, wanting to emphasize the signs. Uh, you know, and the difficult. Okay, I was looking for the sign for difficult. Right, um, that's the sign. Oh, sorry, one moment. Yeah. My phone was coming in on a separate screen. Okay. Yeah, you know, figuring out what people like uh, can be hard, you know, and having these discussions with other data scientists as well. If you'd like to meet them, maybe I could connect you. <laughs> yes, please, that would be great. Yeah, please introduce us. Yeah, I'll do that. Like there are periodically deaf IT conferences where deaf IP people will get together and then they can see and share amongst each other, you know, figuring out what the need is in their different countries 
gathering together, okay, what signs do you use? And then, uh, you know, sometimes they can adopt what is being used elsewhere. That would be awesome. Okay, another question that involves some math and biology. And that word is sequence. Sorry, would you, this is Audrey, would you mind? So, okay, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, and so is that sign the same way when talking about biology or in math? So in math, do you have a sign for sequence, Jason? I don't really know what's conventional, but this is how we typically represent sequence. And that could be sequence or structure. Okay, because it's like the order of things, the sequence of things. I sign sequence like this, which is pretty similar. What about in biology? We would sign it like this. For example, the sequence, a DNA sequence. I would sign it like this. This is Audrey. Mm, yeah, there's some similarities there. Yeah, but I see the sign that you use in math. And, hmm. So a question in math, uh, sequence, but then also about series. How would you differentiate those? What I say is series like this, almost like a sum is the series. Mm, okay. So, right. So a series is more so uh, representative as like a total as opposed to a sequence, which is represented almost in an orderly fashion. And what would be your sign for series? Uh, something like this. <laughs> and what about algorithm? Athena, I sign it almost like a rule or an algorithm with an A. There's no other signs that people have. This is Jason. There's no other signs that anyone has for algorithm. I'm looking at the two German signs that exist. Do others have other signs? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Okay, so Athena had one sign for algorithm. In Germany, we have two. One is like this, and this is the other one. Mm, okay, algorithm. So with a G hand shape. Yeah, I like the steps, the little steps along the way. In BSL, this is how we would represent it. I don't know if that's right or not. Yeah, we get some for discussion. Uh, do all of you work at Gallaudet? No. Why don't Where we do come? introductions actually? <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and have people introduce. I guess uh, start with Audrey because you're the second person on my screen. Sure. Yeah, this is my sign name, Audrey. Spelling it out for you in BSL. And I'm from Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland. I work in research and how children learn STEM and scientific science. I wanna better understand that. Um, and also how children learn to read and become fluent and literate in ASL science. I've been uh, working for 15 years. And I have been recording various signs. Oh, project. Thank you. Uh, I also am an educator. And I teach hearing people as I teach, I teach uh, science to hearing people. Next up is Jason. I will go, my name is Jason. I do work here at Gallaudet. I am a math professor here. Uh, 
Athena? So I'm in my final year of my PhD uh, teaching neuroscience and avatar, uh, you know, virtual people, whether they be in movies or games or the like. So various signing characters. So I do research in terms of how people can learn um, from that movement. And I'm currently a postdoc planning research on iconicity in sign. Oh, interesting. Naomi, did you want to go next? There's some question about where. Oh, are you at Gallaudet? Athena? Oh, yes, I'm at Gallaudet. Naomi, how about you? Hello, I'm here. Go ahead. <laughs> my name is Naomi. I work at Purdue University in Indiana. Pepperdine. I'm, oh, Pepperdine University. Excuse me. My apologies. Oh. I am a data scientist for a group called the Data Mine. And you're correct, yeah, Caroline. I have a colleague right now who's eating their lunch, and so um, they can't be on screen right now. And her name is Kaylee. She also works at Pepperdine with me. Okay, we have about 30 minutes left. And so I think I want us to talk more about the future. Um, because we do have some key questions that are gonna be important for us to discuss in terms of organizing the conference that eventually hopefully will happen. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to pull up. The first question is, you know, what research questions should we be exploring? If we are applying for a grant, we need a research question. So what research questions are important for STEM in terms of developing to, you know, what's important there? Well, I think it's important to have um, these meetings where we talk about different topics, different ideas, right? We have, in addition to these conferences or ambition to these discussions, what else would be helpful? What else uh, should we be looking at and discussing? What else, what more do you wanna know? Whether it's an international conference or do you think that that's not necessary? to bring more folks from around the world together? In face person? To face. Yeah, I mean, we have online and we have research, but would that be helpful? Maybe just something to think about. So one thing that I do want to mention, I read a book called The Code Breakers And it was from Jen Jennifer Duha, who came up with Spur. And anyway, it was about her. And so when you're developing new technology, you have to back up from there and think about ethics, the ethics behind it. What will be the ethical use of CRISPR? You know, not talking yet about who should be there, who should be present at the table, you know? who helps make these determinations about STEM is an important thing. And I feel like that question hasn't been answered yet. The other component to this is when we're talking about language, 
there is language variety. Should we have a level of standardization or should we not? So for example, okay. You know, there are these chemical labels that are standardized on an international level in the hearing community. There's the metric system, which is standardized on an international level. Should our signs be on a standardized level in that same way or not? So I think these are the sorts of questions that I feel like have not truly been discussed. So we're talking about setting up dictionaries, we're talking about setting up these meetings, but we haven't gotten to the heart of the discussion that's fundamental to these questions. So is it worth having a conversation about that or am I imagining this? In terms of the human community or hearing community, they often standardize these concepts and so they're used. So it makes sense that uh, when deaf individuals uh, or have standardized this in English. So I guess it would make sense that in, in sign, we should have a similar level of standardization. Well, but we think too, you know, about scientists and the work that they do um, with hearing people. I mean, okay, maybe there's a deaf individual moderately involved through an interpreter, but we're talking about the bringing together of a deaf exchange of ideas. And that can be hard when there's a variety of different signs to be on the same page, to have those cross collaborative conversations. And yes, we should respect the different cultures, but I don't know, I feel that tension in terms of would standardization be beneficial for deaf individuals because we are such a small group of deaf people doing STEM, you know? And I think about America's yeah. role and how many people there are. I mean, you think we're a big group, but really we're a very small percent. The people who do math and whatnot are a very small percentage of people who do STEM. So here it's very small. You know, it's just, if even if you're talking about school signs, and we're thinking about access to STEM and there being less access to STEM. And we want to be able to support better access so that we can grow the numbers of people in STEM. So that's the ultimate goal. You know, we're talking about having signs so that there can be clear comprehension as people are reading. And the problem really starts from children at a young age not having access to these topics. And so maybe that's easier in America, but I don't know. So what I've seen in America is many educators, um, there's many educators here that use sign as opposed to Europe where it's often oral. So it'd be nice to see that start to increase. Yeah, it's like, why is that happening? Right, nice to see, it would be nice to see that improvement and start to move forward and progress. But I think obviously people in various areas here have, they could work together to try to develop that vocabulary because there's people who work in silos who maybe use different vocabulary items in their everyday use. And if they were coming together, they could start to communicate how maybe one sign is used here, for example, CO2 um, versus sequence and whatnot, or triglycerides, things of that nature, and come together for maybe you know an hour and just give a presentation or lead a discussion about how they might use or represent these concepts. And obviously that would be an iterative process that would take place over a couple of days or a couple different, a series of different presentations. And it would be nice to include, um, you know, these sort of talks in sign language. And they could be related to, and that could be more interactive to talk about the STEM discussion and maybe developing a dictionary or a lexicon. We could break into different thematic groups if, if necessary, but important that deaf people are leading this work and doing the presentations. So people are becoming more aware of who that person is who's generating these lexical items. Yeah. You know, I think in the past, you know, people, or maybe, you know, it might be, it might be inspiring for people to come and you know attend these lectures and see who these individuals are and you know that might lead them to do more research or be able to incorporate these signs in their everyday work. So for the DAC, you're talking about having scientific talks. 
and I think that was good. Uh, you know, having a conference, I think that could help. And I think that the DAC might be more, um, more about more geared towards linguistics, mm -hmm. uh, deaf studies, and the like. It seems like the STEM group specifically is a smaller percentage of that. Yeah, or almost a smaller subset of that community. And I think, you know, we could really expand quite a bit in terms of our STEM uh, discussions, presentations, discussing research, all your valuable contributions. I think STEM is used to not being able to understand presentations 100% of the time, right? We have to, there's usually some variation. We get the important general concept and that's about all. So it would be nice if researchers were or people were invited to come and present their research or present, you know, their, their STEM ideas. And that way we could actually see those STEM signs being used on the first day and sort of, you know, get these in our mind and start to think about them and then bring them to the table for discussion. I think oftentimes STEM projects, you know, there's so many STEM projects happening, but no one is really talking about what works and what doesn't. We're not having those critical discussions. There's no set of best practices that are established in terms of signing STEM signs. There's no project that's guided in that way. You know, and I think maybe if it were th three days, for example, the first one is more presentation based, the second is more discussion based about STEM, and then the third would be developing some sort of best practices, some sort of protocol for how to move forward. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I agree with the, the idea of designing some sort of design principles, some sort of standards for specifications, because you can see what's working and what's not working. And then that can translate into policy and more specifics. You know, maybe the goal isn't to have a sign per se for each thing, but maybe there is a gesture. Um, you know, we see there's an increase in research about gestures and that learning about gestures improves memory retention, the way of thinking through scientific terms. And so I think there's a lot of research that exists out there with the use of the hands and the body in learning. And so I think that's one thing that we can look to or borrow from in terms of that and then translate it to the field of sign language in terms of a design principle. What do you think? So in terms of the three-day approach, I think there's three, you know, the three different avenues that we could take with this. Having a STEM conference, it'd be nice to have something that's more local, where people are staying there for the full three days. So they have more of those, yeah. um, you know, uh, conversations before or after, you know, the conference and really start to establish a dialogue and a, and a rapport with another. And then be able to not just break into our groups, but still maintain that discussion and continue that discussion throughout the three-day conference. And I think of the third one similar to the Tisler conference that happens with linguistics or their sign language conferences. Or if there's more of a linguistics discussion um, that could be divided into a subgroup or it could be um, something that's taken on with the larger group. In linguistics, what we often see is people who are, have large contributions, you know, leading discussions, giving presentations. And I think in STEM, maybe we want to emulate that a little bit. If I can. Yeah, I think that we should not necessarily think about taking everything from linguistics, but at the same time, I do think linguistics just has a wealth of seeing what has worked and what doesn't work. And sometimes there are other fields that have some overlap, like in the area of gesture, where you can see how people are using gesture. 
And so we can be better fitting what people need. And so I don't think that we need to take the linguistics framework entirely, but I do think we need to think more carefully about what we need for STEM signs, for seeing how the applications will exist in the educational field, for lectures, for sharing. But, you know, in terms of food for thought, what we can think about, have we thought about that? You're right, yeah. Yeah, linguistics tends to be, you know, a smaller group. And it's important to bring in educators, or excuse me. Maybe we can include just a few linguistics in our group and talk with them about how math would be taught and whatnot. I think it would be nice to bring in visuals too, for, you know, for example, like math, things that really start to cement those concepts and those could be involved in, in those discussions too. Or really for any work, it doesn't have to be for academics. It could be for things like chemistry, bench work, science, any sort of science that are related to those fields, those could be involved too. And that could be something that's more specific and niche-based or something that's more general. This is Jason. Um, speaking about people outside of the field, here in the United States, we have legal interpreters. Am I right, Dr. Solomon? That's correct. So yeah, there we... are, you know, different subsets in the interpreting profession, legal interpreting, medical interpreting, where interpreter will receive training in legal signs or in medical signs. And so I'm just wondering, you know, does that mean they would be going through the same experience that we are? Okay, well, how do you come up with the sign for this law? Because you know, how will we sign this medical term? Because right now it seems that there is some standardization because they have this certificate, which is standardized. And I don't know if that's something that we could draw on as well on the experience of interpreters or if there's not so much an application there. It's interesting because I remember I was presenting and there was an interpreter who was um, interpreting for me in Washington. And that she wrote it as an entire thesis during her master's program about uh, interpreting STEM concepts. And she specifically wanted clients who were um, working in STEM fields. And one recommendation I have for certification, one recommendation I had was a certification in STEM that went beyond just legal and medical um, qualifications. So if there was some sort of program that could be offered for interpreter training in STEM fields, for example, make sure that interpreters are very comfortable interpreting in computer science, for example, or particularly biology as well. It's important to have interpreters, you know, who are just feeling comfortable in STEM generally. And then they could pick their speciality. First is they can't be afraid of it. <laughs> Two, they have to be willing to learn and to constantly be uh, modifying and, and um, improving their podcasts. Maybe that's through NPR or various podcasts. That was something that I found in research that might be helpful. Okay, great. And I, you know, I would love certification. You know, I would love it if, you know, we had STEM interpreters that could fly to various conferences but like if I'm going to a conference like say in Chicago or something, I don't know who the STEM interpreters are. I have to use Facebook in order to find those. It would just be nice to be able to go into, go online and you know run a search and find people who are already qualified or certified for that work. Yeah, so I see we only have about 10 minutes left. And so I'm just thinking about you know other people who might want to come on screen and introduce themselves or share any ideas or signs, share about who they are. Um, I see that there are more participants on the list than who are on screen. Um, so Tom Kate and Stephen. Maybe Kali is ready.
So yeah, I'm just thinking about people presenting at conference. The sign for iron, you know, FE signing it like ironing. They knew it was a chemistry conference, but they were still signing iron like an ironing board. Hmm. So I, I think did. sometimes interpreters need more education in those STEM terms. And this is Jason, I've got to run. Um, I'm Kali, I can introduce myself. I work here with Naomi, uh, also as a data scientist. But my real background is actually electrical engineering. So hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you. You're having, uh, you know, really thoughtful, insightful discussion. I'm really enjoying uh, all that you're sharing. It's making me think. Yeah, I do have a question for you to think about in terms of that conference when all of us were to come together. Who are the people or individuals that you would like to attend? Right? Who should we invite? Students, or should it be researchers, people who are doing the work and engaging or leading various programs? What sort of individuals, interpreters, should we invite them? Um, you know, people who are involved in linguistics. What are some ideas that you have in terms of who would be invited for this type of conference? Yeah, I could talk to someone who works in linguistics with me and maybe get some idea of, you know, having one individual come, you know, I might ask um, about, yeah, coming to America. Well, and so if we're, it were to be held in America, would it be at Gallaudet? Would it be at Rochester? I guess it doesn't really matter, but would it be easy for people to come in from Europe? Yeah. Should it, or would it be better for us to go to Europe? I know it might be difficult for people to fly over and then people need to make sure that they have funding and secured to be able to fly, especially if they're students, this might be difficult. I think, we, you know, we want to be equitable in terms of what the costs are involved for people to come together for this sort of event. Yeah, so it's interesting with grants. I remember in the past, there was a vertical mentoring workshop in 2012 and how we got money for that is we got ac accessible computing from the University of Washington. And then I was also able to receive a workshop money for molecular cell biology division. And it was enough to pay for students' flights. But it was interesting because I was just reaching out to NSF, the different divisions within NSF. And interestingly enough, there was no real response of like, oh, yes, it seems more like to receive funding, it has to go through a submission to an existing grant or an addition or appendix. So if there was already a grant that it was be like a supplemental. So again, pulling in these supplemental grants to make it work. I don't think it's like we will get one grant for this workshop. And so what that means is really reaching out to people being like, hey, can you add a supplemental to yours? Can you add a supplemental to yours to get the money that we need together? Now, in terms of how that would work internationally, should we be making sure that we're including students? Because I really think in their development, they should be involved. I'm thinking like graduate students, master's and PhD level students should really be involved. So, you know, people who are professors or people who are working can figure out the flight costs. But I think for students especially, I think we really need to support their flights. I think bringing students in is important. It's important to have the younger generation coming in and thinking about and iterating different ideas and science for concepts. That's a really rich group to draw from. I think they should definitely be involved. And especially because they're going to continue to teach and generate these signs. And we could be able to show them pictures and concepts and be like, okay, well, what works with this, what hasn't, because they're so fresh into it um, and have them sort of help brainstorm these ideas. In Rochester right now, um, I think in the summer, I, I want to say in August, they're going to have a deaf sign. There will be a deaf scientist who's a student in Rochester 
or students in Rochester that will come together. And it will be national, it will be, you know, obviously Rochester, but then national, it will open up to national um, attendees as well. So there might be people that could go and that might, I might go to that and um, see if there are people there that are interested. And I think that being able to draw from that group to pull together um, a small team where we can have these sorts of discussions, you know, and then this could, you know, be a series of discussions that we have over a period of years. And that might uh, take place in Rochester, might take place in Germany, but the location of those meetings could vary. One thing that I'm wondering about here Okay, there's this preference for being in person, but oh, I'm sorry if someone else was, okay. But, you know, could we offer some opportunity or a virtual option so that people could connect that way? And so maybe it would be, you know, being in the audience with a student who's unable to come, but they could still figure out a way to be able to be involved in the discussions, I mean, I know that it could be difficult to navigate, but I also think it would be a really nice opportunity to have more than just the people who are able to fly. I think to have a bigger reach for feedback, for interaction. I know that it would be a lot of logistics to figure out the best practices there, but maybe that could be an additional option that we add in. Yeah, you know, we talked about maybe a hybrid option. I don't know about that. Yeah, that's what Naomi just suggested. I really think flying in and being in person is valuable. I know it can be frustrating, just the hybrid aspect of it. But, I mean, just having that in-person um, is yeah, a lot I better than I think online. So I don't know where location-wise, thinking about, the funding, the flights. Hmm. Well, I was thinking in some, you know, countries like China, for example, if there are deaf students there, I mean, we have really, you know, the, the institutions there are very limited. They're really not immersed in STEM, but once they come to other countries, they're able to study and do their research. And as we develop STEM science uh, for those populations, it might be, you know, like for example, math at Gallaudet is something that for sure they would want to learn. And then they could bring that back to their home country and start to teach that. That might be the only thing that they use because they're still developing their STEM vocabulary and their base of um, sign users who use STEM uh, vocabulary items. That China itself might just not be there yet. They don't have it. One, do you see the comment from Scott in the chat? Dr. Salman said, turn your video on, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. Sorry, I just had a different meeting and now I just wrapped up and joining you guys. Do you mind introducing yourself quickly, Scott? Sure, hi, my name is Scott Smith, hello. I have a PhD student in science education. I am very close to finishing and wrapping up my PhD. Wow. So yeah, uh, I think that in terms of the conference, I think that we could do all of that. I really like the idea of doing a series of conferences and being able to bring together people in person. I think maybe bringing them together online and then finally having everybody in person might be a good idea. I think it's a good idea to get started and then, you know, maybe it's like once a month we do a one hour lecture, have a conversation on different topics periodically for a year or two, and then also have that in person component that can be more in depth sort of at the end of that. Yeah, a week of socializing, having a lot of heavy discussions and really brainstorming. And then over the years, little by little, you know, we make some incremental progress. 
because if the presentations happen online and you have conversations, it's better to have the face-to-face -face piece because on Zoom, that ability to engage can be hard to ask questions with videos off, but more periodically conversations can happen. Okay, we have two minutes left, so. I do have one thing. Can I post this recording on YouTube? Is that okay with everyone? I wanna get everyone's consent. And I will also uh, save the chat intentionally so we can use those as notes for reference, whether that's grant applications or whatever it might be. So if anybody is interested in becoming part of the organizational or the planning committee of this, please just let me know. Um, and obviously, um, I think Audrey will be involved, of course, and if anybody else would like to be involved, please let me know. Yeah, and I see also um, Tomiki, Tomki's comment. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that person's involved in my work uh, with electrical engineering. So hello, Tomki. Yeah, I think meeting in person would be great. Yeah. That face to face is really important, but right, getting all the financial details worked out so people can actually make that flight and make the trip is going to be uh, complicated. Okay, so then what I think is. Uh, you know, we can make an announcement or whatever our next meeting is, you know, focusing on conference planning and preparation should be our next step. So thank you everyone for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.